very good morning to all of you. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, China Open. I'm David Inglis here at the Asian Financial Forum in the city. And I'm Yvonne Mann. Here are your top stories. China is set to ramp up stimulus with a surprise triple R cut, signaling Beijing's urgency in dealing with the market route. Analysts see further steps coming. Chinese equities are poised to extend that two-day rally on the latest support measures, but many investors remain skeptical due to its gloomy economic outlook. Plus, Tesla stock drops as it misses on fourth quarter earnings forecasts and warns of weaker sales growth in the 2024 year. Obviously, not delivering those delivery targets as well. You know, came out as pretty weak, or I guess vague when it comes to those uh, guidance there. But Dave, it is all about what we heard in that PBOC briefing yesterday afternoon. It was a deeper cut in the triple R, earlier than expected, and delivered in a way we haven't seen before. Absolutely. Breaking from tradition. In, in fact, this time yesterday, I was looking at the, the, the greater China agenda for today. You know, that briefing was actually uh, slated, so you could actually see that they were going to say something. Uh, but, but to your point, right, they broke from tradition. They, don't, they normally post any announcements on monetary policy on the website. He came out with it live in a press briefing. So re that really, I guess, in many ways, positively shocked markets to where we are. And, Perhaps uh, it maybe leads into uh, more action ahead. You know, fiscal and monetary in sync perhaps gets us out of this, uh, I guess, in some ways, the cyclical rut uh, that these markets find themselves in. And it's certainly been a, you know, a, a, an interesting backdrop, if you will, the weakness and the softness uh, against all the conversations we'll have here today. In fact, in about 30 minutes from now, we'll be focused in on just this, the drying up of, of deal flow and listings, fundraising with, with CICC. They'll be joining us in about uh, 25 minutes from now exclusively. The head of investment banking joins us. Plus, of course, as you can see on your screens, lots of other uh, sort of broader themes, including technology, finance, and how all of these things come together. So, yeah, lots to look forward to there. But in the meantime, of course, we're still focused in on these markets. We could get a day three, won't we, Yvonne? Yeah, we'll see. We're, we're, we're set for that here. Futures, though, are pointing slightly to the downside here when it comes to A50 futures. Uh, but then again, you talk about that two-day rally we saw on the H share market yesterday. It's perhaps was one of the big gains that we've seen since that reopening story back in November 2022. So maybe it has still a bit more momentum given just not just the triple R cut. It was a series of other things that we saw as well. Adding support for developer funding by easing some of these loan uses. So we're watching some of these property stocks, bank stocks, of course, at that open here today as well. But looking at broadly speaking, U.S. futures are pretty flat here right now. We did see a bit of that drop in dollar China. We eased a bit here just given the yield pickup we've seen across the curve in treasuries as well. But you're watching out for Asia. It's still slightly lower here today. We're watching SK Hynix, uh, those earnings that came out here as well. Uh, not doing too much here for the stock in Korea. So the cost is lower by a third of 1%. Taiwan, though, still getting ever closer to those all-time highs for that market. And we're watching commodities. Metals certainly getting a field day on the back of the surprise triple R cut. We're extending that rally here right now. You're watching Shanghai futures uh, when it comes to copper. Uh, also, crude are up some 1% here. Iron ore and Dalian also up some 2% this morning. And then we're talk about the FX, right? Keep in mind, we still have an ECB rate decision on Thursday as well. Euro dollar is hovering just below that 109 mark. And we're watching some of these China proxies, Aussie dollar, a Korean one, still seeing some weakness here as well. But the Japanese yen also continuing that downtrend of, of weakness here today uh, post BOJ. Looking at the yield curve, so that's really what has been driving perhaps the dollar moves and the FX moves here today, not so much the China story. And you see basically most of the, the parts of the curve in the U.S. fixed income space is back to those levels that we saw when the Fed decided to pivot in December. So we're way above, well above 4% for your 10 and the 30s. We're watching the Aussie uh, also bonds there up above basis points in the 10-year. And JGBs continue to see that climb uh, as well as we mark, of course, that hawkish comments from Weida that came out just earlier this week. Of course, it's all about one governor, though. It's Pan Gongsheng and what he did uh, yesterday here talking about that triple R cut. Let's hear more. There is still sufficient room for China's monetary policy in the next stage, and we will continue to strike a balance between short term and long term, between stable growth and risk prevention. Starting from fifth, uh, February the 5th, we will lower the RRR by 0.5 percentage points so as to inject 1 trillion RMB liquidity into the market. 
Let's bring our next guest, Zhang Jiwei, President and Chief Economist at Pinpoint Asset Management. So it was interesting the way he did it, um, but yeah. what was the rationale behind this cut, you think? I, I think there's a sense of urgency, right? So I think there's a really a reaction to what happened to the equity market in the past couple of weeks, uh, both in onshore and offshore. Um, uh, and we started to see a signal from the government uh, on Monday, for instance, at the state council meeting that um, Premier Li said, you know, they, they had a discussion about the capital market and they will take action to boost confidence among the investors. And, and then we saw this uh, triple R cut. So I, I think this is a really a reaction to what happened in the equity market. I think there will probably be more actions to follow, uh, particularly you know interest rate cuts. Okay, what, what do you think? I mean, is, is it does it push forward all, all of what you were expecting this year in terms of what's on the pipeline now? Yeah, I, I would say on the monetary side, yes, definitely. I, I think that you know the the triple R cuts already announced. I think in the market, I, I think before yesterday there was a lot of debate about whether interest rate will be cut or not. I think now uh, probably the majority of people would, would believe interest rate cuts are coming. So monetary side, definitely. Mm. But physical side, I'm not sure. That's the key thing, right? So yeah. for this rally to, to sustain, to, for, for people to change their macro outlook for China, the GDP numbers and so on, we need physical numbers. Uh, so monetary policy can help the sentiment for you know a few weeks or, or a little bit longer. But to change the long-term picture, you need both monetary and physical. Yeah, as you say, right? I, I don't think cheaper loans are going to do anything to boost confidence here right now. I, I want to get your take on this particular line that you thought was quite interesting mm. from the PBOC governor. The PBOC will provide conducive monetary policy environment for financial markets, including capital markets. Yeah. Why is this important that he said? Well, this is, this is very interesting, and particularly for people, you know, been following central banking business uh, for the for the past say decade. You know, look around the world. The people, you know, central bankers they do a lot of things to influence the the capital market, but they, they, they rarely they talk about you know, capital market as part of their objective functions. You know, they, they always say we cut yeah. interest rates to help, you know, inflation, uh, labor market, GDP growth, uh, even, you know, uh, balance of payment. But they usually don't talk about the capital market as something that they really care about. They, they, they want to take action to address problems in the, in the, in the capital market. They, they talk about financial stability, but that's a little bit different thing. Mm. So that's a very uh, uncommon remark. That, you know, some people may, may look at it and say, well, does it mean that PBOC will do something like Bank of Japan to, to buy ETFs and mm. things like that? I mean, that's, that's, not, that's <laughs> not my take, but I think some investors might take it that way. Does it make you at least think that the fact that he's saying that, that he is, you know, policymakers do care about what markets are doing right. in some ways. And that what follows come through is not just talk now. It's really going to be moves and, right. and maybe more forceful action. Yeah, yeah, kind of, I, yeah. I, I think so. I think so. I, okay. I think the, you know, uh, triple R cuts is, is already announced. And then the next thing is interest rate cut. I think the likelihood is, is, is quite high. I mean, he pretty much implied this is coming um, probably around the Chinese New Year. That's, that's my expectation. Yeah. And then we're, we're heading into uh, the People's Congress in early March. I think the government probably working on the budget, the, the work plan, right? So I think the budget number is probably not finalized yet. So, you know, the pressure from the market may actually influence the thinking in terms of how they set the fiscal numbers. That's important. What, what are you thinking in terms of the fiscal side? What's still needed? Are cash handouts still, well, still work in this? In well, yeah, so two things. Uh, first of all, it's a highland number, whether you know, the fiscal deficit can be higher or the total government spending can be, can be higher. Even if you know, it's not included in the budget, maybe there's some other you know, sort of a special uh, bonds or, or spending that uh, they, they, will, they will include. Uh, so that's one thing, the highland number. And then the second thing is where they spend the money, right? Yeah. So whether they put it in investment to build more factories, roads, or, you know, boost consumption, right? Send yeah. consumption coupons. Some cities in China are already doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very big difference because China has deflation problem. So if you put money into investment, you actually make the problem even worse, right? So the, the right way is to, to boost consumption. So the, the mix of, of uh, spending is also important. They've, they've been doing it in some cities, you say, cash handouts. Oh, yeah. Has yeah. it been you know, working Shenzhen, then? I, I think it does. I yeah. think it does. I mean, the, but, you know, these cities are small. Yeah. And, and a lot of these cities, they don't really have the fiscal capacity. Um, so like cities like Shenzhen have been doing this for, for a couple of years by now. I mean, Hong Kong actually did this right, yeah. very aggressively. And, and there's already academic research that shows it works. So um, hopefully on, on, the, on the national level, I think, that, you know, among economists, there's a very strong consensus. The government should move in that direction. Um, so, so let's see. I mean, we, we'll find out in the next couple of months.
what, what you mentioned about the budget deficit, I'm just wondering what, what sort of numbers are you crunching at right now? Yeah. Where if, if it is in fact 5%, that's going to be maintained in terms of the target this year. What sort of budget deficit do we need to see? Well, I think in the market, kind of a, uh, the current expectation is somewhere slightly above 3%. Yeah. Um, which, which is not a, not aggressive at all. Uh, so, so if it is, you know, that's probably why the market was not doing very well in the past, uh, uh, particularly the past uh, months or so. Um, if the, the, the budget deficit becomes more closer to 4% or even above 4%, I think that will be positive. Is all of this enough to, to get China out of deflation, or is this something that it's just going to take more than a year or two to, to kind of get out of this funk that we're seeing when it comes to, to well, deflation? I, I think the uh, it really depends on the policy action, yeah. right? So uh, the faster you, you react, the, the stronger signal that you send, like what the governor did yesterday. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you know, more policy from, 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 you know, there's coordination between monetary and fiscal policy that we saw in the other countries, like Japan, U.S., yeah. Europe, that they did it already. If that kind of thing happened, then change the expectation. It, it could end within a year, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but you know, the longer you wait, this could drag, drag on, particularly feed into the expectation of property price, that, yeah. that will get things even worse. Yeah. Okay, Zhu Wei, always good to have you. Zhang Zhu Wei there, President and Chief Economist at Pinpoint Asset Management. Uh, and coming up, gonna hear from JL Warren Capital and CICC as well on what this means, right? The Beijing's latest stimulus moves doesn't have enough firepower to really boost markets for the long term. We're also counting down the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong already reacted to that triple R cut yesterday. We're waiting for the A share market to wake up and see futures though. Pairing back some of the earlier losses were flat here this morning. This is Boomer Markets, China Open. Right, good morning. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. China open a glance at futures pointing slightly lower ahead of the open, about 15 uh, minutes away. We're waiting, of course, for first reaction in the onshore markets uh, to that surprise cut, uh, at least timing wise, in the PBOC here. Uh, we should also be getting the fix any time now out of the PBOC. Could also act as another anchor for these markets, Yvonne. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're seeing at this point. Yep, it's out now at 7.10.44. So, yes, quite a strong fix here against the consensus, about 600 pips or so. Uh, so certainly another strong sign of support for the currency. We did see that bit of a drop in dollar China after that surprise triple R cut. Pair back a little bit here, just given what we've been seeing uh, with the dollar moves, uh, the, the, the bond route that we continue to see uh, externally. So certainly that's still one thing to contend with, but certainly still seeing some strength here this morning. 7.16.09 for your offshore rate, Dave. Yep, and let's see if, I mean, these are just the early, early sort of innings in chapter one of Operation, you know, save the cyclical downturn in China, right? And a lot of this eventually needs to lead back to the consumer and consumer confidence and really what that means for corporate earnings. And, you know, we all know, of course, about the, the non-inflation, the low-inflation environment in China, squeezing some margins in many, many parts of this market. In fact, let's bring in Chun Hong Li, now founder and CEO of JL Warren Capital, joining us now to talk us through all things consumer, all things tech, of course. There's also Tesla earnings, ASML. Uh, we might get to NVIDIA as well. Jin Hang, a pleasure to have you in the show, and good morning from the Asia Pacific. Let's start with the macro in China. How is the weak macro backdrop showing up in your, in your analysis at this point? I mean, Q4 was largely weak. Um, so, I mean, the triple R cuts that you guys talked about in with the previous guest, I mean, I think the key here is surprise. And, you know, cuts are better than no cuts. Stimulus uh, is better than no stimulus. So, however, I agree with your previous guest. Um, credit stimulus alone is probably going to be limited in its effect. Uh, in fact, a uh, triple R cut was done back in August, and that didn't really flow through um, the GDP growth number or the consumption number. So the uh, earnings uh, remain pretty weak uh, coming out of the fourth quarter. So we'll see. I mean, we are only three weeks into 2024. So and because of the Chinese New Year timing and all that, um, the first two months uh, uh, number is going to be volatile. Uh, but we'll see. It's it's going to take a while for uh, the credit uh, stimulus to work throughout the system and um, in, have, have some impact on the consumption, et cetera. Right. And it's interesting, 
I mean, you bring a very unique uh, insights into this because you cover stocks in the U.S., you cover companies, of course, also in China. And I'm wondering, just from a bottom-up fundamental analysis, are you are you having to attach a premium, uh, a valuation discount to Chinese, uh, you know, Ch Chinese corporates, for example, that you look at because of just what's happening and just the, the wide gap between these two markets and how they're valued? Uh, sure, certainly. I mean, I think everyone realized that um, you know, China, uh, Chinese economy is on this uh, downturn, and there's no clear roadmap to, uh, for a uh, um, guaranteed uh, recovery. Um, and on top of that, there's uh, geopolitics and the risking between the two largest economies in the world. So. All those have been largely reflected in the evaluation of uh, multinationals. So um, I do agree with some of your guest commentaries on the technical aspects of uh, Chinese uh, stocks and the multinationals to that effect, in that the valuation is pretty close to the trough. So it doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, upside, whether it's a surprise, you know, triple R cut, or it's, uh, you know, the stabilization fund to get involved in uh, onshore uh, stock buying to have some uh, sentiment boost and have caused some uh, stocks rally. But uh, uh, from a sustaining perspective, um, longer term, I think it really uh, we need to sh we need to see the confidence recovery, uh, whether it's sort of uh, from the deregulation or it's from some sort of a sustained kind of a roadmap. Uh, to uh, uh, rejuvenating the private sector, uh, whatever it takes, but I think it's unlikely in the near term. You mentioned before that, you know, for those that dabble into U.S. stocks uh, and want to get exposure to China, it's really more about trading those multinationals versus maybe even getting to ADRs. Are, are ADRs still, yeah. on, uh, you know, you can't touch right now? Yeah, I think the interest in the ADR is so low right now. Um, most people, especially you know the serious money uh, in the U.S., um, such as uh, you know the law only uh, the established institutions like capital groups or um, Fidelity. I mean, they do want to stay away from China because of the lack of visibility, um, whether it's from geopolitics or from FX or from, you know, the econo uh, economic recovery. So the safer way, if you still want to participate, the uh, China upside, potential upside, it's really through the multinationals. And um, because, you know, then there's a diversi diversification of uh, revenue sources. Uh, you mentioned about visibility. I think, you know, investors that were watching at Tesla were a bit disappointed because there wasn't much guidance here when it comes to delivery targets for the year. Uh, what do you make of the guidance from Tesla that came out? I think it implies that the peak growth, uh, the growth for EV leader Tesla in this case has already peaked. So, I mean, you know, it's the two largest EV markets, the U.S. and China, have but their own set of issues in the U.S. I mean, Elon Musk always complained about high financing costs. But it's also likely that the uh, uh, penetration, the adoption rate is already kind of uh, fully saturated. So the early adopters have already bought a car. And for you to penetrate into the markets that are not likely to be the targets for EV, such as the Northeast, um, it's going to be difficult. Uh, for China, it has a different set of challenges. Um, it's the competition, and it's um, it's um, the competition from uh, Chinese uh, uh, car makers and uh, the product cycle. Tesla tend to be much slower right. than the Chinese companies in developing the second and third and fourth generation products. So, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, that... All in all, it seems like the EV growth story has kind of peaked, and uh, it's all about like market share, who's going to take more in a slower growing uh, EV space. Mm. Jun Hong. All right. Jun yeah, in fact, on that very point, I want to ask you, do you think Tesla gets further pulled into this this price war in China because they've had to cut some of the prices that they, uh, of the models that they sell in China? I'm wondering if uh, we, we should be watching out for more price cuts ahead from Tesla. 
I think absolutely, absolutely. Um, they just cut them, uh, the price for Model Y in January, just uh, two weeks ago. So as a result, uh, Model Y is only selling 4% above Model 3, which doesn't make sense. So in other words, I mean, no one in China is going to be buy, is going to buy Model 3 because you just pay 4% more, you get a Model Y. So really, exports will be the main destination for Made in China Model 3. So I think they will likely to adjust the Model 3 price again, and that will have impact on the Q1 margin. So um, not, it's Tesla story is not only about the yeah. growth of top lines, also about the margin erosion. And that's not fully reflected in the Q4 margin because you have the uh, lithium price coming down. Um, but that's a lot of people talking about the battery price has already dropped. So 2024, we are looking really at 10 billion net profit for the company. Right. And then times 30, uh, 30 times P, that's the highest valuation you can ever give to an EV company, okay. right? That's 300 billion yeah. market cap versus the stock trades at 600 billion right now. Yeah. Jenhan, we've got to leave it there, but thank you so much, Jenhan Lee, their founder and CEO of JL Warren Capital. Uh, just some breaking news coming through here. A net injection uh, of liquidity, 366 billion RMB from the PBOC here today. We're watching also uh, how pre-markets are doing here in Hong Kong. Looks like day three is happening when it comes to offshore markets here. We're extending that rally by six tenths of one percent. The pre-market A shares also catching a bid. Your agenda coming up. This is Bloomberg. Never thought I'd all right, we're looking at futures here right now. A bit of a, a, a bit of disparity here. We take a look at where 8 to 50 futures now. We're actually seeing quite a sizable drop right now of 9 tenths of 1% uh, here. MSCI China futures are down 7 tenths of 1%. Hang Seng, though, pre-market seeing day three. So maybe that's where uh, investors are really tilting towards here, this Hong Kong market. 7.16.25 for your dollar to China. Your open is up next. This is Bloomberg. What I think they're trying to do right now is signaling we don't care about the stock market. You can see that by the fact that it has gone down year after year after year lately. But at a certain point, we're going to have to set a floor to let people know that the government is behind the system. And that's what they're trying to do now. They're just trying not to overpromise. And the question is, will investors see that as enough? Yeah, there we go. Leland Miller, the China Beige Book CEO. Welcome back to the program. You're watching Bloomberg Markets China Open. 20 seconds. And hopefully, on 20 seconds to what could be a third day of gains in these equity markets, is this still mostly a short squeeze or are animal spirits really returning to this market? <laughs> They've been missing for a long time. Yeah, you got to wonder, is this just a tactical lift, you know, given that finally... We're seeing some forceful action of the PBOC. They're listening to markets in some way. Hong Kong is responding to it continuously here for a third straight day. CSI 300, I mean, we saw that massive drop in futures leading up to this open. Looks like we're starting things off still slightly under pressure in Shanghai. CSI 300, we're still around that 32,072 level here. And we're catching a slight bit on MSCI China here as well. HS Tech, though, interesting to know, is in the red as we open. But look at metals. That is where you're seeing this being reflected across markets. Iron ore is up 2%. Shanghai crude up 1.5%. We saw those in copper futures as well. Of maybe this is where people are expressing that optimism that maybe we're finally seeing, at least on the monetary policy side, uh, that you know this was a forceful move, 50 basis points, sooner than expected. And, and the fact that the PBOC governor delivered this live during this press briefing, uh, going against what we've heard before traditionally, where they announced it in the state council, does that mean a bigger message here, that maybe more to come? that Pan Gong Shen not done quite yet. We're seeing in terms of sector by sector, it's a mixed picture. Financials though are doing okay. Developers though, there you go, in the far right corner, you're seeing that 1% pop there. Macau Gaming is also up some 1%. So uh, you know, the fact that they, not just with the triple R cut, there was also about extending loans to the property market, making it easier to get those loans. That was also part of the series of, of rescue efforts that we've seen uh, from policymakers uh, in the last couple of days or so. Then take a look at what, what is really moving this market. Let's focus on those property developers and see how things are going. Uh, obviously, we're watching Country Garden, Evergrande. Those two are still heading lower. We did see a, a decent pop 
mind you, in the Hong Kong market, right, as they react to the triple R. So maybe, you know, that's not lasting too long here on the property shares. But look, ICBC continuing those gains in the A share market. We're up eight tenths of one percent. And Alibaba, after that seven percent pop yesterday on news of Jack Ma buying its shares, uh, we're seeing a little bit of downside here today. Watching, of course, the EV supply chain. Uh, also, EV makers like BYD on the back of those, uh, you know, guidance from Tesla, which analysts are saying were vague, inconclusive. Uh, maybe just goes to show maybe it's the peak, as, as Jun Hong Lee just told us. There's a BYD is down some 3 percent here right now. CATL, the battery maker and supplier to Tesla as well, also lower. And we're watching some of these Boeing suppliers as well, given the FAA in the last couple of hours with that news of them halting the Boeing 737 MAX production expansion. Uh, not much change there when it comes to those on the supply chain, Dave. Yep, uh, we'll continue to track these markets. A lot of earnings coming through. I think the, the the point you just made a few seconds ago, Yvonne, on I think Jack Ma and of course uh, Joe Tsai coming in and New York Times article they're buying, of course, thinking that Alibaba is undervalued. I guess in many ways underscores the what the, the, the cheapness this market is trading in and maybe perhaps uh, what lies ahead as far as maybe deal making is concerned. No better person to talk about that. Joining us here on set at the AFF is uh, Barry Chen, of course, Managing Director and Head of Investment Banking Hong Kong at CICC. Good morning. Morning, David. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's very busy. You have a very packed schedule today. So what, what have you guys been busy with? Uh, busy in business, uh, obviously. I think uh, we have been uh, very active in uh, developing our new client, new market. Okay. And in this region, in Hong Kong, obviously, and also expanding to some other countries as well. Market sentiment has been weak. Uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I like how it's almost comedic at this point. Um, w what's keeping an investment banker busy while things are extremely quiet? And when do you think things improve? Oh, I think it's a good, it's a good time for us to get ourselves better prepared because, uh, okay. to be honest, no one knows when the market will come back. And mm. it would be a general belief that the market will come back one day. So, <laughs> so I think it, we should be better prepared ourselves to yeah. get the pipeline, to get a client ready. And if the market comes back, we can be the first one to be back to the market. Right. And, and give us a sense of the, you know, where you think activity might pick up, which sectors, which clients specifically, or which sector specifically do you think that will start to show up? I think put it this way, people now, especially investors, are quite losing confidence. Yeah. What I will say is to try to rebuild the confidence. Then where the confidence will come from? Possibly, go back to the basic, is those good companies, those companies that will be able to make profit, to be able to enhance the productivity. So what we see, what I see would be something like um, a technology, um, advanced manufacturing and uh, green. I think that is the theme that people are looking for in the futures. Do people have money or are they looking to raise money right now? In other words, they've been sitting on, I guess in some ways, dry powder, just looking to deploy that money. Do you get a sense that there is money lying around or do you think people will need to uh, raise more money in capital markets at some point? I think obviously so. people have money. Otherwise, those um, wealth management, you ask them, right. they have very good business in the last year. It just depends on where to put the money, where to put the money to get it more productive and efficient. So we, again, we come back with some good company, good investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that this money will come back. A deal volume this year, uh, fundraising, IPO market, do you have any insights on what, what 2024 looks like? Because 2023 was a very soft year for fundraising in Hong Kong. I think no one will be able to predict precisely right. what's going to happen. What we try to do, again, so if the theme is to rebuild the confidence, mm. is to try to bring some good company to the market. Some company like, especially those A-listed company, it will come to Hong Kong, sizable, mm. demonstrated um, profitability in the past, dividend pay of ratio. I think that is something that the market would really love to see them. Right. You mentioned building business and preparing for the eventual improvement in the market conditions. Is appetite still there? Uh, just to pick up on your point of companies onshore in the Asia market just waiting on the sidelines to, to raise some money here in Hong Kong. Is that an accurate way to d describe what's going on? I would say it's waiting. I mean, every business, they always want to advance themselves in terms of the capitalization as well as the business. So what we want to do is, again, to pick the good company yeah. to be here. 
and especially in this moment of time, I think it's also good for us to link in some others and new money, I would say. Like what AFF we are doing today. Right. We see to this year AFF compared with previous years, we see some new market, especially those from the Middle East. I think that's also the linkage that we want to bring them to Hong Kong, bring them to China. That's interesting because as I was walking here this morning, there's actually a very big hall there, simply on Hong Kong and Dubai, for example. <laughs> uh, I know you guys are might be busy in the Middle East uh, this year. We can talk about that next time, but give us a sense of what you are expecting in terms of cross-regional flows between Hong Kong and the Middle East? Because we've seen really a lot of business delegations head to the Middle East out of Hong Kong and China last year. Yeah, I think last year we see the chief executive has went to the Middle East for the official visit. Mm. And uh, what we see is the theme from the Middle East is that they try to want to do this transformation of the economy. Okay. Reducing, relying on only oil or energy to have some other thing to do, like the new energy or even tourism, pharmaceutical. That is something they want to develop. I think China has definitely very good experiences in this kind of industry, as well as the industrialization in the last two, three decades. Vice versa, the sovereign wealth fund, especially in those regions, is well known for their deep pocket. Yeah. So I think they are. I heard looking... they have a lot of money. <laughs> I think they're looking for the investment, good investment in this region. Right. As a matter of fact, we closely do where we bring this uh, software development to invest in one of the Chinese companies for a small amount, but 20 million. But it's also very significant in terms of a landmark development for them to come to China. Do, do, we, do we get more of that? Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what I was going to ask you the broader role you think CI, you know, a unique bank like CICC can play in, in that. Are you looking to take money here or are you looking to take money to the Middle East, from, from Chinese money to the Middle East? Like, which way do you think it's going to be more busy? I think both very busy. Okay. Yeah. Both way means that um, maybe people would think that the Middle East is well known for the for their money, but vice versa, there's also some Chinese money in the last two decades developments. We have a good of saving. Hmm. People is looking for not, I mean, for example, their production plant okay. and manufacturing base. They need to go outside China for a better location, better taxation, better productivity, etc. So I think that is also the one of the direction that we are looking seeing that. Mm. I think it was a few months ago since you brought it up. I was speaking with a Chinese solar equipment maker, yeah. and I think the plan is they they wanted take some of their production capacity, I think put up in Saudi, for example, it's a good example. Is that a trend you think we'll see? Production capacity of Chinese companies, home-based in parts of the Middle East? I think it makes perfect sense. It makes Why? perfect sense in the sense that like, um, if the ultimate market is somewhere like in Europe, in terms of the logistics, trans transport, mm. you will go to Middle East anyway. And in terms of the, as I mentioned, taxation, they are they are well known for their no tax, mm. not low tax. Yeah. And I think of also for energy, uh, the, I mean they have abandoned of energy that is very can be supportive to the, to the manufacturing. Mm. So I think it makes perfect sense for people to to move some of this um, or expand their production in the Middle East region. And not to get into politics, because that's not what we, we're going to do, but do you think the geopolitical situation is playing a very big role in this trend of Chinese companies looking at the Middle East, for example, as a hedge or a, you know, a plan B, for example, or just another, another avenue of growth? Yeah. I think you mentioned that. I think it, make, it would make sense in the last two, three decades. Okay. China has been benefited from the I think, open up of the, uh, the world. Not just China, the whole world has been having benefited. Hmm. And China want to have some percentage of increase in the GDP. The easiest way is just more export. But now we see that well, to certain extent you will have a plateau somewhere. Right. So we need a new market. I mean I mean naturally middle in the past have not been very active in terms of this kind of trade or cross border investment. I think that will help to give more energy for continuous growth of the Chinese economy. Final question, since we're here in Hong Kong, I mean, you've attended this conference before, right? As a regulator, of course, and now, of course, with CICC over the past few years. It's, it's relatively quiet still. I, you know, it's, it, the traffic hasn't really come back. Do you get a sense that the financial services industry here picks up this year because the job market's been soft and front office roles, as you probably know, are not, not in as demand as, as before? What's your sense of the improvement we'll probably see this year? 
Mm, I would say I've always tried to be optimistic, okay. if not in the long, short term, at least in the long term. And we have been so called suffering in the last four, three, four years. Mm. So it may be a good, good time for people. Again, you have money, pay the good investments. If we still have resources, mm. as you said, there's talent in the market. It may be a good opportunity for us to pick the best talents to help the ICC. Yeah, I think there are lots of, there's a lot of available talent right now <laughs> looking for a home. Barry, nice to see you. Good. Ha have you. a good day. Barry Chan there, of course, Yvonne, a Managing Director, Head of Investment Banking Hong Kong at CICC. Back to you. Great conversation there. And yeah, you, we've been checking markets here during this conversation. It's interesting how things are changing here. So Hang Seng is flat. We've erased some of the earlier gains. And now we're actually seeing Shanghai pick up in terms of momentum with the Shanghai composite up about six tenths of one percent. But you look at what you know the calls are post triple R cut. And, and we talked from Hui Shan from Goldman Sachs and her team talking about, look, this was quite a, a dovish Pan Gongshen in that press briefing. So they're expecting the PPOC rate cuts coming through here, triple R cuts in the second quarter, fourth quarter, you have shoulders, talking about recent pledges, may provide that tactical lift, but does it actually mean a sustainable turnaround? They say no, maybe more is needed for a structural climb. And Jujo Investment Asset Management was saying, we're at a very key point where a market rescue is needed. Such a plan could indicate what it's now going to be more than words more decisive action potentially here from policymakers moving forward. Hang Seng now 15,888. Now, despite something of a rebound this week, the recent route in Chinese markets still reflects an underlying lack of confidence in the Chinese economy. And that is the subject of our big take today. Joining us now is our Asia stocks reporter, John Cheng, with that story. John, tell me, is this a short-term rebound or could it actually be a market bottom? Morning, Yvonne. So I think most people will agree that um, the latest rescue efforts are actually exceeding expectations, whether it's the stabilization fund or the triple R cut we saw yesterday. This is all more than what the market had ex expected, but whether that can be something more long term, it's, it's still quite hard to tell at the moment. Most people I spoke to agree that there could be a short term tactical bounce just because, you know, valuations are cheap. Um, investor positioning are very light. Um, we have the BOVA survey from last Last week, seeing um, Asian fund managers and most underweight China stocks in um, many, many years, and also most benchmarks are oversold by now. So, you know, there can be a, a short term bounce, but whether that can be something more long term is quite hard to tell. And if we use the experience from the 2015 market crash, you know, when the regulators step in to rescue the market, that usually marks the bottom. But this time around, the situation is probably a bit different because we have so many structural problems in China's economy. So. You know, I think the key really lies in whether there's more persistent effort from authorities to rescue the market, and that will be something people are very closely watching out for. Yeah, the title of the big take is is that this stock wipeout exposes deeper problems for, for Xi Jinping. I mean, why do you think investors are still skeptical about this market rescue effort? What are some of the other catalysts that can, we can expect in the next few weeks or months? So I think the situation has really evolved into a confidence crisis not just for uh, foreign investors, but also impacting local households and retail investors. So, you know, and, and confidence is a very tricky thing to revive, right? So um, people are saying, you know, um, this confidence crisis um, this doesn't necessar necessarily um, guarantee a big bang or sort of broad stimulus to revive, but, you know, it, we need to see consistent efforts from regulators. And, uh, you know, um, that is something market will be very closely watching for and something to look forward to would be you know Lunar New Year's New Year holidays are coming up and you know February is usually a light period for macro data so any spending data from the holiday period you know whether it's travel data whether it's movie box office will be very closely monitored and also we have the two sessions coming up in March so that would be another key to key thing to watch as well. John Chang, our Asia Stocks reporter, joining us out of Singapore. Make sure to check out his team's big take here today, a deep dive into, of course, this stock sell-off in China. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
right, we're watching, of course, these chip stocks uh, across Asia on the back of those SK Hynix earnings, which actually reported a surprise profit. Uh, also, bets when it comes to AI chip demand. That's not really helping the stock here this morning. We're down about 1.5%, but it is lifting some of the other chip makers across the region. Here you take a look at Samsung is up. Taiwan Semi is also up more than 1% here right now, Dave. Yeah, and that really goes into the that conversation our, our, our colleague Tom McKenzie really had yesterday, and also the reason why we woke up to European equity markets at a, what, 23-year uh, high ASML, right? Record high there, says it's seeing positive signs still here in sales, because it's after orders already, in fact, more than tripled last month. You can't make these numbers up. So the CEO, in fact, even told us about the outlook for China after export bans came into force, and with Washington even looking to curb uh, these tech ambitions of Beijing. Have a look. 90% of our business in uh, China has to do with mature technology. And that's the technology that we need for all the major transitions. You know, if you think about energy transition, the uh, electrical vehicle transition, digitization, rollout of uh, the smart grid, uh, 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 you know, life sciences, it's all mature technology. That's where the masses are, yeah? So what is your message to those in Washington, lawmakers in Washington, lawmakers in The Hague even, who are pushing to expand those restrictions beyond the most cutting edge lithography machines, to expand those restrictions on the sale of lithography to China? Well, you know, I have full respect for national security concerns. That's not the point. But I think we need to take into consideration that this chip industry has created an almost seamless ecosystem across the globe that has given us massive advantages in terms of innovation and cost reduction. So that from an economic point of view, we need to make sure that that economic uh, system that we have created, which has given us so much benefit, that we keep that intact. Uh, it's not about national security. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that innovation uh, can keep going. Huh? You are, you're stepping down in April. Does your successor at least have to war game the possibility, the scenario where ASML has to operate in a global market X China? Well, you know, uh, I don't know whether he's war gaming. I don't think he's a gamer, to be very honest. You know, we'll just have to deal with the reality. But I also, you know, I'm an, I'm an optimist that worries a lot, uh, and I do believe that uh, we have created, uh, you know, uh, uh, macroeconomic systems that are so dependent on each other that um, I think that is a, a scenario you can always put into a into a game. But I don't think that's a very realistic one. You do not have generative AI without ASML. It's as simple as that. Without your extreme ultraviolet lithography machines. How much demand are your clients saying they are seeing for chip making equipment to generate those kind of AI chips? Well, let me first of all say that I think the full extent of what AI could bring is not totally clear because it's all about the applications. Yeah? Uh, and that still needs uh, to develop. But one thing is absolutely sure. It's, it's going to need massive amounts of compute power and storage, data storage. So I think um, without um, uh, ASML without our technology, that's not going to happen. So it's, it's, it's very clear that it's going to be a big driver going forward for our business and the business of our customers. ASML CEO Peter Winnick there speaking to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. We're checking markets here once again. And yes, uh, it looks like markets are turning a little bit less optimistic or at least failing to really embrace this triple R cut. You take a look at how onshore markets are doing. And yes, it is still, we've erased some of the initial gains. We've been swinging between gains and losses, really, uh, in Shanghai. Hang Seng is now lower, and HS Tech is really dragging things. We're seeing that benchmark down uh, more than 1.5%. Keep in mind, though, last two days, uh, that's where you really saw a lot of the action, this rebound in Hong Kong. Maybe it's time to take some profits, but certainly you are seeing optimism in commodities. Take a look at that. You're seeing Shanghai crude, copper, iron ore still rallying. There in China. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, so uh, we are seeing markets here and under a bit of pressure in greater China here right now. If you take a look at just how history and what it tells us, right, when we've seen market rescues like this before, it brings it back to 2015, right? If it's any guide, maybe it means these gains will not last. You see that in 2015, that green box right there. Basically, one's trying to mobilize the market and they stabilize. Once that stopped, the market fell further. 
you know, the big point is really it's still about the economy, right? We need to see the fundamentals really change. The bottom panel is where inflation is. The fact that we're still stuck in deflation, that is a key indicator of maybe when markets are really finally going to turn. Once PPI picked up in 2016, you can see that's when the market did as well. In terms of the rest of the market, we're watching the EV stocks in particular. Take a look at Neo shares, Xpong, these EV makers getting hit hard by that Tesla guidance there, those earnings talking about, you know, tepid growth or slower growth moving ahead. We're watching some of these uh, airline stocks as well, just given we heard from Boeing. And your dashboard looking like this here in China, you are seeing now uh, greater China is still looking pretty flat this morning after that triple R cut. This is Bloomberg.